Sewist Collective podcast. The Asian Sewist Collective is a group of Asian people from around the world brought together by our shared appreciation for fiber and textile arts and our desire to see more Asian representation in the sewing community. In this podcast, we explore the intersection of our identities and our shared sewing practice as we create a space for Asian sewists and our allies. I'm your co-host, Ada Chen, and I'm recording from Denver, Colorado. Denver is a traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. I'm a Taiwanese-American marketer turned entrepreneur, and these days you'll find me running my own all-natural skincare business called Chuan Skincare, that's C-H-U-A-N, and sharing my marketing tips on my blog, The Cultivate Method. Most importantly for this podcast, you can find my sewing at i.hope.so on Instagram. And I'm your co-host, Nicole. I'm based out of Chicago, Illinois, the original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa people. I'm Filipinx American, and I'm a woman, and a lawyer by day, and a sewing enthusiast the rest of the time. You can find me on Instagram at Nicole Angeline Sews. So before we dive into this week's episode, Nicole, can you tell us about your current sewing project? Yeah, I am currently working on a peppermint maxi dress. Have you seen that pattern before? I have seen that pattern. It's the peppermint mag like free pattern, right? Yeah, so it's a, it's the wide strap maxi dress and it's free, but you can and probably should also donate a few bucks to Peppermint Magazine. And I believe this one was in co- uh, collaboration with Elbe Textiles. Um, and so it's, it's super cute and... I am currently making it with a check chambray type thing. Um, I would, I'll have to, you'll have, it's probably going to be on my feed by the time this airs, but I actually purchased it uh, from a D stash, uh, an Instagram D stash. I don't know if you've ever shopped, you know, another sewist who's D stash before. I should probably do that too. <laughs> was this Macy's D stash? It, it, it was, I was texting you during that and I just <laughs> bought a bunch of her stuff. It was. And, um, so it's a it's a little bit what makes it heavier is the plaid 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 it's like plaid inception so it's it's like binding in but like I'm not doing a great job describing this on chambray in a check pattern but the binding itself is plaid oh it's really cute it's almost I'm not a really cute person. I mean, I'm, I am I am cute, but like I'm not like a cutesy patterns and stuff kind of person, but I, I really like it. So it's cut out uh, and I just have to stitch it up. But oftentimes after I cut fabric, that's kind of where the work stops. <laughs> and then I've got to put it back in my just get to it, Nicole pile. Um, but I'm looking forward to wearing it. I mean, it's getting toward the end of summer, but I'm still pretty much just making summer stuff. So we'll see. What are you working on, Ada? I was going to say maybe I should cut one out and join you, but that would require printing, finding the motivation to print and tape the pattern first, Mm. which on a maxi dress, you know, that's a lot of pages. It is. um, It was. I, so if you recall in season one, I may have done two front crotches on a certain (laughs) pant pattern, the Elizabeth (laughs) Suzanne Clyde pants. Mm. And um, I have rectified the problem and, and found the right size for me. So thank you, Mariko, on our team for helping measure the rise of your pants to tell me some more sizing information. Um, but I just finished some Elizabeth Suzanne Clyde shorts, which basically involved just shortening the pant leg um, about 20 so plus or minus some inches. Um, I just measured the pattern pieces on myself and then kind of chopped a line across at the under the crotch curve and was like I'm gonna match the curves on the patterns and then just like fold the pattern up and cut the fabric this way Um, but I really wanted them for a craft fair that I did this weekend for my business and I just needed pockets like you need to hold your phone your wallet your keys and then your like card reader and all the things whenever you're running a booth and so it just seemed like a really practical pattern for me and all my other shorts are short shorts which also didn't feel very on brand or like me that I wanted to be wearing at the booth. So I whipped those up on Thursday and I got to wear them on Saturday. And then it was so hot that I, I normally Mm. don't wash things immediately. Like after one wear, unless I've like really sweat through them, active wear with standing like that, you should just wash because you're sweaty. 
But uh, it was so hot. I sweat so much that I <laughs> just needed to throw them in the wash. So I will photograph them when they're out of the wash. But they are in the matching fabric that I sent to you, Nicole, uh, that I thrifted oh, yeah. with that big floral print. And you, too, can make some shorts and we can match. I know. I have enough left. I made a dress for a, a test. But when I saw you made the shorts, I was like, we should matchy. I'm going to I didn't pattern it. match these either. <laughs> like, you nah. don't have to pattern match this pattern. <laughs> No, I, I definitely didn't when I made the dress. But yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, I, I I just made a new pair of shorts too. And when I saw that you made those Clyde shorts, I was like, ooh, I should make I should make some. And we should match. It's, and nobody can see them because they're shorts on the podcast. Yeah. But it's well, also a podcast. It's, yeah, the, the pattern is funny because you think with the pockets that it would have to be a longer short. But actually, at least on the size that I made, which I believe was a size six regular, the pockets come right below the crotch curve anyway. So you don't have to worry about cutting the pocket bag or the pocket lining when you're shortening the pant legs. You just have to shorten the pant leg, the front and back pieces, which was kind of nice because I was a little bit worried about that. But It makes it easier to turn yes. it into shorts. Yes. Very cool. We're delighted to introduce Ella Clausen, a Black and Filipinx garment sewer who can be found on Instagram at handmade millennial. So for any of our listeners tuning in today uh, who are new to you, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, who are you? How do you identify? And how does your identity intersect with your sewing? Yeah. Hi, everyone. So I'm Ella Clausen. I am um, a home sewist in the Oakland, California area um, and the creator behind Handmade Millennial. So it's been it's been f- a fun project where, you know, over the last couple years, I have been teaching myself how to sew mostly through patterns and on YouTube and and kind of wanting to share that experience with folks. Um, yeah, I've, I've focused on kind of sustainable ways to create garments and kind of beautiful modern styles and and focusing on, you know, things that are interesting to, to people just like me. So that's what I do at night. And then in my day job, I also work at Levi's at their Red Tab Foundation. So very far away from the actual garment production process, but still kind of a, a through line of, of, you know, being in the textile world and among textile appreciated people. So yeah, you can find me on Instagram there where I talk a lot about my projects and what I'm up to and, and, always looking to connect with new folks. Thanks, Ella. And since Nicole and I just rambled for a few minutes about our current sewing projects, is there anything you would like to share with the audience that you are personally sewing at the moment? Yeah, I couldn't do a big project this weekend. I'm so excited. So I downloaded the um, Rose Cafe bustier dress pattern by Daria Pattern Making, and Ooh. I've worked through a couple twalls over the last few weeks, and I cut into the fabric for the final garment today, which is so exciting because I had some troubles with fit on this one. Um, I'm kind of small busted, and so getting the cup to bustier fit just right was was a bit of a challenge, but it's actually going to be um, my wedding rehearsal dinner dress. Um, and I'm getting married next May. And so that was really fun to get to, to cut into the, the fabric. It's this beautiful, like embroidered beaded white, um, white fabric. Um, and I'm just so excited to use it. And also really nervous because I've never worked with beaded fabrics before. And there's all these weird things you have to do so that the fabric doesn't like unravel. Um, so it's an interesting, fun challenge to be using that and also to be doing a bustier dress. Well, congratulations on your uh, it, kind of upcoming wedding. But um, <laughs> it's, I, was like, I was like, wait, what date is it? But I'm sure it will sneak up on you quickly. Um, so and uh, also you. the the pattern I've seen it around and it looks Same. it looks amazing. But the the fit is what kind of scares me, like t- doing the uh getting the fitting right but maybe I'll 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 take a crack at it someday because uh, I did see what you were working on and it looks really really beautiful thank you yeah two twalls to get it right and even then I like I reached out to Daria herself actually and sent her a video and was like what am I doing wrong and she Aww. actually gave me like kind of like a personalized consultation was like try this try that and like that's what I love about indie pattern makers like she was available within like 12 hours to help me with a problem and so it's, it's been a fun process, and I love working with indie designers. Two oh. does not seem like too many. I was going to – when you said a lot, I was like, oh, my gosh, did she do five? Because I've also seen the pattern, and I'm also smaller busted, and so I'm like, 
eh. <laughs> like like those cups I think in ready to wear they never fit me or you know you have to like do some pinching and like some minor adjustments not minor like you have to deconstruct the cup but um that has definitely held me off but maybe I'll just like follow along and buy the pattern and do it too <laughs> Absolutely. I never twirl. So two was like a lot for me. (laughs) I like never have patience for that. (laughs) Yeah. I'm on the other end where I was like, when you said two, I was like, Oh, I don't, I'm also not a twaller. So I'm like, that's how, that does sound like a lot to me. (laughs) I'm a wearable, wearable twaller. I'm all for it. Or like barely wearable or like wearable by if you have a sister or a friend who's yeah. similarly sized, who doesn't really mind because, you know, what they're buying from Ready to Wear it probably doesn't fit them that well anyway. <laughs> like, this <laughs> top is a wearable twall of a hack of the Atlas top from Stitch Witch because Esther from our team helpfully told me how to move the bust darts. I just, they're not correct yet. They're not over the right place. But, hey, I have a sister who is similarly sized on top, so... She does not listen to this podcast as far as I know, so I can say that it's going to her with, with plenty of mistakes. Yeah, she's That's not going to know. That's the way to do it. Yeah. It'll be fine. So, Ella, we've been following your sewing journey since the end of last year. And can you tell us a little bit more about your sewing journey, like the journey itself during the pandemic? Yeah. So I um, decided I wanted to learn to sew right before the pandemic. I just like had it in my head. Like I've always been interested in textiles and like upcycling clothing. And like I did a little bit of hand stitching as a kid, but not really did I know anything. And right before I was just like in this place where I felt like the styles, the clothing I wanted to wear, like didn't feel financially available to me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to learn to do it myself. (laughs) And there was like a jumpsuit from Reformation that really inspired me. I was like, that looks easy. I'm going to, I'm going to make it. And I took like a six hour sewing machine workshop at a place called Workshop SF in the city. That was super helpful. Um, I love them. (laughs) They're so good. They do the best workshops for anyone in the Bay area. Um, And I was so excited. We made like a tote bag in that class. And I was so excited by it that I literally biked straight from Workshop SF to the fabric store and I made so many mistakes. I purchased, I accidentally spent like $120 on fabric because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but like, I was just so excited and jazzed. I borrowed a sewing machine from my to-be mother-in-law. Um, and that was that was history from there. So I was on and off for a little bit. And then really in the pandemic is when I actually started um, truly creating more garments and really digging down because it's a hobby and a, a thing that, you know, made a lot of sense for when we're locked up indoors on our own. Um, yeah. And it was an interesting experience because I'm sure you guys understand that like sewing is kind of like an isolating hobby. Like you have to do it yourself. You're in a room, like often, you know, not with other people in your life, like you're just kind of like isolated and on your own. And so I was looking for friends and community um, and people who understood what I was what I was doing. I was like making all these cool garments and like sending, you know, photos to a couple of my best friends. And they're just like, oh, cool. That's great. You know, but like no one yeah. can talk about how good that hack was or like, you know, what do I do with this beautiful like French fabric? I found like this is amazing. Like no one else was as excited. So that's kind of how I um, decided I want to get more involved in the, the Insta sewing community and make some friends honestly just to like nerd out (laughs) with about stuff um and I've had a lot of fun like just really growing my skills over the past like year and a half or however long it's been while we've been while we've been home just making like practically an entire new wardrobe for myself I should probably clear out some of the old clothes (laughs) or upcycle them to make room because I've made a lot of stuff and it's just it's been a ton of fun I've really I've really been able to up my skill level that is amazing. And I, yeah, I totally agree. That's why I started a separate sewing Instagram account because I was posting on stories on my personal account and all my friends from, you know, school and life and work were like, that's cool, but <laughs> what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. And I actually, funnily enough, met up with another podcaster whose podcast has nothing to do with sewing and she walked in or she walked to this outdoor bar setting wearing a dress that looked really familiar. And I was like, kind of looks like a Reynolds dress from Helen's closet. It was, 
she also she and I both listen to Love to Sew. It was a Blackbird Fabrics linen viscose uh, blend, I believe, in this beautiful chartreuse color and she was wearing the rounds and we had gotten kind of off topic because we were talking about non-podcasting stuff and then I was telling her about this podcast and she was like wait you know and it was like this little secret like aha moment and I won't out her on this podcast because she's fantastic and she has a sewing finsta as we have called it um but it was just nice to actually like be able to nerd out and she said the same thing like being able to nerd out about techniques and learning with somebody else especially like I, I would say like in the millennial subset group generation whatever we call ourselves now um has been really nice and we I've, I've been following you on Instagram for a while Ella and I think you were traveling right before the pandemic and it, there was something like you visited 10 countries and it looks like you got some great fabrics as you were showing us before can you share a little bit more about the fabrics that you brought back with you and maybe did your travels at all like influence your sewing over the past year year and a half yeah so I was really lucky with the the timing right before the pandemic that um, I was in between jobs and I decided I was going to go on this big backpacking trip on my own. It was really scary, like being a solo lady traveler. Um, And I kind of just did like a full eastward circuit around the world. I started in Vietnam um, and I went to Myanmar, India, Singapore. I was in um, Rome and Italy and London to visit a friend for a bit and then ended in Morocco and Egypt and I bought one yard of fabric of blue fabric specifically in every single country I went to and this is how new I was to sewing that I didn't realize that one yard is nothing <laughs> <laughs> I'm so mad at myself and I carried all this like on my back mind you like I was backpacking and I was so passionate about textiles and so interested and I'd only been sewing for like three or four months before that so I didn't realize you know I hadn't bought that much fabric besides that really bad trip to the fabric first fabric store where I overbought Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah so I have all these beautiful textiles from different places around the world and I came home and I made a patchwork scarf that is now like a beautiful like heirloom of my journey and you know it's just a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful piece and so Yeah, I learned a lot about various textiles in different parts of the world. Most of the pieces I bought in like street markets, different places. Um, And even when we were in India, I learned a lot about um, the hand, the method of hand block printing outside of Jaipur. And that is something that's super special and beautiful to me. It's like these beautiful fabrics where they'll literally take wood blocks and carve out the designs and then hand print them on fabric. So I did a workshop actually where I learned about that process and I brought back lots of block print textiles because I'm in love with them um, and different different beautiful fabrics from all these places. And um, yeah, I don't know what to do with a lot of them because there's not <laughs> enough to do much. <laughs> but I look at them and they look great. That's amazing. And uh, it's something that I hope to do someday. Um, You know, I started actually right as the pandemic, I started sewing right when it started. So it's like I bought my sewing machine February 29th, I think, in 2020. And so um, I've just been sitting here like I want I want to travel and I want to do what you did. I want to well, I will probably not backpack, but like I want to go to places and I want to go fabric shopping and I want to learn about how people produce fabrics and um, one of the things that uh, one of the accounts I've been following is actually um, a company in the Philippines that works with local artisans um, and in and around different areas of the Philippines and the weavers and the techniques and you know what the different patterns mean for the different areas. So I hope someday to to do what you did um, or and and I might have I'm just trying to think like one yard. Like, what would I, I mean, I could probably do the same thing and pretend I know how to make a quilt and then I'll do something like that. But, um, but yeah, very cool. Uh, so in one of your posts, you mentioned that you were raised by your mom, an immigrant from the Philippines who had no understanding of the black experience and that you were raised mostly in a white community. You shared that, quote, it wasn't until I flew the nest that I really came to acknowledge and appreciate what it means to be a black woman in America, the beauty and the sorrow of our people. Struggles, joy, superior dance moves, uh, end quote. So could you talk a little bit about your experience of being a mixed race woman, Black and Philippinex? Like what has your experience been like in the sewing community? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just to, yeah, to, to reiterate a little bit more of, of my, my background, um, I was raised only by my mother who, you know, came here 40 years ago as an undocumented immigrant and later got her citizenship. Um, and my, my father is from like the streets of Detroit, like very different background. And I don't know how I was created because they're like, they don't mix. <laughs> I was a love baby. Um, and it's just, it's, it's this interesting experience where I was raised by my mother who did not have that understanding. Um, and very much grew up in a context of like feeling like a Filipino woman, feeling like an American woman, and, and definitely identifying as the child of an immigrant. Like maybe you guys understand, but like the experience of being an immigrant and or you know coming from an immigrant family in America is so different than than other people's experience or, or the average Americans average in quotes Americans experience. <laughs> Um, and it's something that has always been really important to me. And like, even looking at most of the friends I've had historically through my life, like if I look at the commonality in a lot of them, a lot of them is that they're also children of immigrants. Um, and it was like a, it was an eye opening when I decided to leave home and, you know, kind of opted more into what it means to be a black woman in America, to opt into that culture and, and make black friends and get to know more of what that means. And even reconnecting a little bit more with my father. Um, and, you know, also kind of looking back at the, the racism I had faced um, in my childhood that I didn't identify as racism, like microaggressions and things that I didn't pick mm -hmm. up, like why shopkeepers were always following me around their stores. Like I thought maybe everyone had that experience or, you know, like thinking back on why like certain parents weren't so excited about me being friends with their kids, even though I was like a straight A student, you know, Um and so, yeah, I had I had an, an interesting awakening. And one of the ways that, um, you know, now I've, I've chosen to live in a majority black community in Oakland and I've paid a lot of work and attention to issues of race and equity within my career and the things that I do in my professional life. Um, and in my sewing world, it's it's been a fun experience of one of the ways that I've continued to, you know, embrace my identity and who I am has been through um, working with Ankara wax print, African wood print fabrics. Um, it's kind of like a beautiful way to exhibit black pride and, you know, kind of honor and homage this culture, this West African culture and use these beautiful fabrics that are so um, vibrant and, and gorgeous. And it's been, it's been a fun practice. And, you know, just in a nutshell, I'll talk about, you know, wax print fabrics are really interesting in a very small um, way. I'll tell you that the history behind them is really interesting in that they are like Indonesian batik um, wax resistant dyeing methods that were kind of taken by the Dutch colonizers um, that were, you know, in, in Indonesia. And they, you know, tried to reproduce reproduce the methods to be able to um, resell them uh, better than the Indonesians did. And that didn't work. The Indonesians like knew that that was not, you know, traditional wax print fabric. And so they, and the Dutch ended up selling them to um, many parts of West Africa where they were then adopted and created to be part of the culture and now are just like a huge part of West African, like the way their textiles are, their history. And so it's kind of beautiful in that, you know, wax prints fabrics are like this melting pot of culture of like Indonesia and, and, and the Dutch and West Africa. And like my heritage is also a melting pot. So I kind of just I love that. I love that inclusion. And it's another one of the reasons why, you know, getting to sew with fabrics like that is really special to me. So I haven't gotten to experiment as much with like Filipino um, fabrics and styles. I know, Nicole, you had done some experimenting with like Terno sleeves. And that sounds awesome. I would love to, to try some of that as well. So someday I'll do I'll do some more Filipino fabrics and stuff as well. Yeah, I would love to see you dive into Filipino, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> modern Filipiniana as well. Like the more the merrier. Let's let's uh, <laughs> let's reclaim it, you know. And I think the um, I've I've read briefly, you know, sort of probably about as much as you shared with us the history of wax print, and, and I find you know its metamorphosis fascinating. And of course, the fabrics are beautiful as well. So maybe we'll maybe we'll look into that. I don't know for a future episode or something. But thanks for giving our listeners a primer into the history of wax print for sure. It is definitely yeah. on our list. 
fabric kind of leads us into my next question, which is, it's been fun to see your work across different mediums like embroidery and your videos on fabric dyeing. And your account is all about slow living and self-sufficiency and creativity and your makes across those different mediums. So can you share a bit more about how you got started as a maker? Yeah, so I've, as I mentioned, I've always been really interested in like upcycles and textiles and like I was totally that kid in high school who like I bought like like studs and gems to like DIY my own jeans and like was so totally handy with like a box of red dye, like dyeing things and they looked, those dye jobs look so bad. <laughs> <laughs> They look bad, but it was a lot of fun. So I've always done um, things like that and just been interested in being able to to do things yourself. And then, you know, I also, when it comes to textiles in particular, I've done a lot of work and understand a lot about kind of like the the damages of the the textile industry. Like there's a lot of global mistreatment of garment workers. And I always wanted to be able to, you know, kind of opt out of that system. but yeah, so I've, I've had a lot of fun with, with dyes and, and garment construction. I love embroidery. I actually um, have it on my list. I want to learn um, sashiko, like Japanese uh, visible mending embroidery. And I just bought um, some supplies to, to try that. So I'm always, I'm always trying something new, trying to, to do something beautiful with textiles. So how did you get inspired to dye fabrics using things like avocados and black beans and onion skins? Like, uh, I was surprised that avocados make pink. Um, So, I mean, how how did you how did you get inspired to start trying natural dyes? And then do you have any tips for sewists who want to get into natural dyeing? Absolutely. Natural dyes are so amazing it's like amazing what plants can do as you mentioned like i've only i've only done a couple but avocados make pink and black beans make beautiful shades of blue and purple um, and onions make gorgeous goldenrod yellows to paler yellows and, and there's a million things in the plant world i'm actually growing right now in our little balcony garden i've got a couple pots where i'm growing um indigo plants because wow. you can use the leaves, the fresh indigo leaves to dye things like kind of a teal blue. Um, so that I'm like so stoked for. I've been growing this indigo for like four months. I can't wait to, to dye some stuff with it. Um, but I got kind of started on this concept because um, I had done like a workshop at work. I also, it's funny, I've worked at two textile companies and learned like practically not that much about (laughs) mass textile production from either, but I used to have a job at the North Face um, and they had a couple naturally dyed products. So we did like a little work, um, just like a workshop where we dyed some things with um, avocados and also with like rosemary, which makes like grays and blacks. And so, yeah, it's really beautiful. And especially like, I don't know if you guys have ever used like chemical fabric dyes, but they're really scary in that you're supposed to wear gloves the whole time because the chemicals are really toxic. And, you know, if you splash any anywhere, like your counter's going to get stained. And that is so just irritating and also kind of scary, you know, where it's like if I spill some like of my avocado dye, it's literally just avocado pits and water. And it's <laughs> no big deal if I just like dive my hands in there, you know, it's not going to poison me. And it also doesn't poison water systems, like putting chemicals into water systems is not so good. I'm not so much sure how bad that is at home level, but in industrial um, garment production, like dyes are one of the the worst polluters of, of some waterways um, in, in textile production. Um, and so to anyone who's interested in diving in, uh, I would definitely like take a look at some bloggers who do natural dye stuff. Like some of my favorites are um, Rebecca Desnos and Sasha Duer was the person who taught my first workshop that I um, found really interesting. She has good books. And actually one of my favorite for natural dyes and just general sewing resources is like your local library. Like I had forgotten as an adult <laughs> about the library. Library, but the library is so great. And when I went on the online Oakland library thing and typed in natural dyes, there were so many natural dye books. And I was like, what? Like it just blew my mind. And sewing books. I've gotten really good sewing books. I even got like the newest named clothing, um, their latest book with the patterns and all. Like there's good stuff at the library, y'all. So do that, you know, if you're interested, like check out a book and just learn some of the concepts. Um 
And then something like avocado dyeing is a great way to start. You just like literally take your pits and skins from your avocados, store them in the freezer until you got enough. And then you just like soak them in some water and that makes dye. It's, it's like, it's seriously magic. I have an avocado sitting on my counter right now that I was going to use for dinner. So I'm like, maybe now's the time. So I'll, I'll have to take a look at my local <laughs> library. I, I always get inspired when people come on the podcast. I'm like, I'm going to try that. And I'm going to try that. But this one actually, see, I'm literally going to eat an avocado later. So this seems like something that's doable. <laughs> and maybe I'll, I'll dive in. I think Ella told me in her DMs, because I was like, how did you get that many avocados? Like, I can't possibly eat that many that fast. And you told me in DMs, you're like, just store it in your freezer. I was like, oh my God. And Shailin, also part of the podcast team, was talking about dying on one of our last like informal kind of get togethers. And I was like, oh, you can store them in the freezer. Brilliant. It doesn't go bad. I mean, you know, make sure your freezer's clean and all that. But, um, Aside from the indigo that you're growing, are there any other organic items you want to try dyeing with next? Yeah, I've got um, hibiscus in my cupboard that I've used for tea. Like I make hibiscus iced tea all the time. And I saw recently that that makes a gorgeous dye. So I want to try that. Um, And then not like something from food scraps like those things, but matter root is another thing that um, makes beautiful, vibrant reds. And I got some of that at my local thrift store. I don't know why anyone would give up matter root dye, but I scored. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's a really interesting one um, called cochineal that I learned about. And this is so strange, y'all, but listen to this. It's like cochineal are these little bugs that are found on certain like cactuses and they make the most incredible, they dry them. So sorry, everyone, this isn't vegan, but they dry them and they make the most incredible, like beautiful reds and pinks. And I got some of that as well. So I'm really curious to try some, some beautiful things with that. But I just, yeah, natural dyeing is, is so great. And I love that it's not toxic and it's a beautiful way to um, kind of have your your clothes and dye them yourself especially if you have like clothes that are stained you know and you want to over dye that or just like I don't have anything white because I've dyed everything so (laughs) if you've got boring white clothes you want to (laughs) upgrade or maybe they're a little stained because you're kind of a messy eater which is my constant problem but also I tried matter root um a few months ago and it actually I mean I need a bigger pot like let's be honest I was using my like largest pot that I use for hot pot at home in my kitchen and it was probably not big enough for this um kind of long sleeved jacket that I made swack it for home but it was it came out the most beautiful shades of like rusty red orangey Mm. pink and I think it depends on the matter root and the grade that you get, but also how long you're leaving it in there and like the heat and all that stuff. But it was a great introduction to anybody who is looking to get into dyeing. You can fi- if you can find it at a thrift store, all the more power to you. I found mine on Etsy. <laughs> also great. That's awesome. Okay, I have to I have to try matter root soon because that shade sounds incredible. I have a follow up question. Um, so it's kind of what. Ada was saying about using her her home her pots that she cooks out of. If someone does want to, start I washed nat- it. I washed I, it I, before I and after. It. <laughs> it's natural dyes, right? So we don't have to worry about eating out of the same pot. But what are like a few things that you recommend uh, someone who's interested in trying natural dyeing procure? Like, do you want to just get a separate pot, or um, you know, apart from the the organic items that you talked about? Yeah. So there's like a whole science to it. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't always follow like the like the real people who are pros, like they're very specific about what you use and you don't use. So I'm kind of iffy, like I don't always follow the like quote rules. Um, But you generally want like a pretty big pot because you want the fabric to be able to flow fairly freely. So I thrifted um, of like a, a massive like can fit a turkey in it type pot. And in general, I think you do kind of want to keep them separate just because pots do tend to like absorb some of the like foods or, you know, whatever you're cooking, like the pot does absorb a little bit of it. And so depending on what you're doing, um, it may, you know, that may change actually the results of your color. And then there's also specifics on like what kind of pot you want. Um, I believe I went for like, I think aluminum and stainless steel are really well recommended. So mine is, I think, 
one of one of those but that that does also matter a little bit too but outside of that it's like i have a separate um dye pot and dye tongs and then um yeah, then just like your organic dye ingredients. And then also there's a couple things that, you know, people, there is a million ways to um, pre-treat and soak the fabrics beforehand to get them prepped for dyeing. Um, one of them is an ingredient called washing soda that you use to like pre-wash the fabric to really just like, it's basically a deep cleaning. Um, you scour quote the fabric, that's what it's called. And you can either buy washing soda pre-made or I actually found out that you can take baking soda and put it in the oven and just heat it and it changes the chemical composition um, to be a different type of pH that is washing soda. So I didn't, um, I didn't even go out of my way to find washing soda. I just had baking soda already at home and I did that. Um, but you could buy baking soda. And then also um, alum is another pretreatment that you can optionally use to make the dyes brighter and more beautiful. And that's something you can also find at your grocery store. It's like in the spices aisle, people use it for canning. It all seems accessible mostly. <laughs> so finding I did the pot not... is the hardest part. I was gonna say, like, that sounds like a for anyone who's into cooking, you need like a stock pot that yeah. is tall. Not don't go with the seven quart pot that I went with. Because <laughs> that is not large enough. <laughs> I'm curious since you've dyed so many different things and made so many different things. Is there any one piece that is your favorite so far? Yeah, I love the avocado dyes the most. It's like, for anyone who hasn't seen this, it's like a peachy, pinky coral if you do it right. Um, it can also be a lot paler than that, depending on, you know, the level, the pH level of your water and all sorts of different things. But I've made a couple tops that I, or I dyed the fabric and then I made a couple tops out of them and they're like absolutely my favorites. And you know, another thing about natural dyes as well is that they actually, um, if you wash them right, they shouldn't fade in the wash, but they do fade naturally over time with sun exposure. And that's kind of another part of the process, you know, it's natural and it naturally fades and the color changes and evolves. And I think that's a beautiful part of it. Um, and so like my black bean dyed fabric already started kind of a periwinkle blue and it's already turning into like a vaguely grayish purpley color. Um, so they change, they change over time. Okay. So that really sounds amazing. And I think a lot of our listeners might be interested in starting up. So thanks for giving us the tips, hopefully at least to get started. And you know what, like I'm a fan of the local library, the public library. So if that's, if that's a, a good place to start, then, then I'm a big proponent of that as well. So are there any other fiber arts that you've tried or that you'd like to get into? Yeah, I did. Um, I did macrame for a while as well as like knitting and crochet, like before sewing, like it's a miracle that sewing stuck for me because I am like a serial crafter. <laughs> like I pick something up, I go full tilt, I drop it two months later and never look at it again. I've done that. <laughs> one of the things, <laughs> right? Yeah. One of the things in the closet behind me is this big laundry basket full of all these yarns. Cause I was so excited and like, so like, <laughs> You know, like I collect it just like we collect fabric. You're so yeah. excited by the possibilities. And then, I don't know, I should probably donate those or something. <laughs> but um, I'm really curious to learn more about quilting, um, especially I have so many scraps and I want to find more ways to use them and not waste them. So that's something I want to do at some point is is definitely quilting. And then, as I mentioned, I'm trying to, to learn soon sashiko embroidery. I'm excited about that. Very cool. And I think quilting is one of those things as well for me that I feel like I was not interested in at all until I started to meet people who, for lack of a better way to put it, like I related to more that were also into quilting. Um, but yeah, Ada's got a quilt behind her right now. First truly quilted piece of anything because I had done, I guess it's called like a single piece. The quilters are going to get mad at me. I'm trying. Sorry, I think quilters. it's like the, it's like single piece quilting. So I did one of those as a baby blanket for a friend and then uh, sent that off and had a decent experience with it. Like I didn't hate the quilting aspect of it. So then I tried piecing together this Redwood Coast quilt by uh, by Ravi, who is pretty close to you, actually, Ella, because I think she's in Berkeley. And she this pattern is great. 
I just didn't anticipate how many pieces there would be. And it felt like, you know how sometimes you get to a pattern and you're like, I'm almost at the end. There's like only two more pages of this PDF. And then you realize that there's actually like 10 steps in the two pages. That is how I felt finishing this quilt top. And that is not any fault of the pattern or by review. I still highly recommend it. I just was not prepared as a garment sewist for like how many pieces would be involved because, you know, like pants, you're like front pieces, back pieces, waistband, it's like five pieces. This, this, there's like a hundred pieces on here. <laughs> that is intimidating. That's pretty intimidating. Hurrah that you even made it this far. I, I have three more months to go before the baby who this is destined for <laughs> is going to see it. And as other folks have pointed out, Arthi on the podcast team, especially because she is a quilter, the baby won't know if the seam is not straight. <laughs> that is true. I love that. <laughs> and like, neither will the parents probably, hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, they're yeah. not taking a roller to it. Yeah. Quilting is one of those things where it's like, before I was, you know, kind of immersed in the indie pattern world, seeing like other young sewists what they're up to, like, there are so it seems it seems and I felt this way about sewing too that there are so few resources for people like us who are interested in these things like one of the reasons I wanted to you know start my channel too and like kind of curate like indie and fresh and kind of modern feeling resources is because the things that are out there for sewists and I what I, I think for quilters as well are just like very much like for a certain demographic of person who you know is a little older than us and, and, you know, has a different style and not that, not that, you know, and they're probably sewing for their grandkids and not that that's a problem because those people need resources. And I'm so glad that exists, but like, it was so hard to find resources that felt young and fresh and modern. And like, even that featured people of color. And, and that was so strange at first. And, and yeah, and I just, I wanted to find a way to kind of celebrate and curate when we did find those cool things. And now I'm glad to see now that I'm a little bit more immersed in it, that there are lots of, of young people who are creating resources for each other and designs. And you just have to dig a little deeper and be deep on the deep on the internet. And I think some of, I mean, it, a lot of it is the resources, the, the loudest voices are they tend to be the oldest and the whitest. And so I am neither, well, you know, old is relative, but like, you know, so I I mean, but um, so I appreciate the work that you're doing in in sharing and promoting these unique and fresh, they don't even have to be young, but you know, just something new and different because that's how I get excited about, you know, stepping into a space like potentially quilting. Like when we talked to Bhairavi or when I met Arthi, I was like, I have never really seriously considered this as something that, uh, I, like I said, or like I related to. So um, it's very cool uh, that you're that you're keeping an eye out and sharing those resources with everyone. And so just turning a little bit from sewing, I do want to talk about your your day job. So you work at the Red Tab Foundation as part of Levi Strauss. So what is it like working for a garment company? And have you found any inspiration or tips from the industry apart from the your previous position where you dabbled in natural dyeing back then? Yeah, so so um, the Red Tab Foundation is an emergency hardship assistance fund. So we help um, Levi's employees and some factory workers and, and anyone who works for the company through like emergencies, like if they're about to be evicted from their house or something like that, we'll do cash grants. So it's very different from clothing production, unfortunately. And I have been like starving to meet some designers and some people who are in that side of the business. Um, but I started the job in the pandemic. So I haven't gotten as deep as I someday know that I will. Like they promised me a tour of the innovation lab. I'm waiting Mm -hmm. in my dream scenario. I'm going to meet some people who will give me beautiful scraps and some like (laughs) rivets and back patches. And I'm like, I'm waiting, (laughs) but it has been really cool to hear a little bit more about the influences and also to learn a little bit more about, um, I will say, I don't know a ton about like the technical production and factories that happens and how, all, um, you know, a lot about the design process, but I do know a lot about like um, sustainable practices in the garment um, produ- production space and, you know, how to better treat um, factory workers and the people who are making the clothing. And so that's been really interesting. Um, and, you know, in my personal shopping and 
and and such to you know to kind of what to to look for when people talk about how they treat their how how companies treat their garment workers and how things are produced um yeah look for fair trade organic cotton you know things like that wherever wherever you can as consumers look for companies that have like worker well-being programs and and such um but yeah, to, to get to your, your point as well, like another one of the, the favorite examples I've had that have affected my sewing personally was like when I was really starting to get into machine embroidery, I bought um, a machine that's a combo sewing and embroidery machine. And like, I don't even call myself an embroiderer because machine embroidery is cheating. It's yeah. so cheating. You buy a design, you put it on a USB, you stick it in the machine, you hit go, you know? So it's not like I like really do much except for choosing the colors and the placement, which, you know, that could be considered art. I don't know. I feel like I'm cheating. I still enjoy it. Um, and Levi's has tailor shops all over the country. So they'll do like custom embroidering, um, like whatever design you want, they'll embroider on something. And so when I was first getting into it, I had reached out and was successful in finding like the head embroiderer at the the San Francisco shop, um, the master tailor, I think is what it was called, and was just like, oh my gosh, how do you stabilize your fabric? What type of machines do you use? Like what kind of thread? Like all these things, totally nerded out on him. And he gave me um, some really helpful and cool advice about how the how the pros do it, which is fairly different than like my cheater machine. So like not all of it was relevant. <laughs> um, but it was, it was a lot of fun. And so, yeah, some, someday soon I'll get to learn more about um, like how they actually make the designs and stuff and how the sourcing works for the materials. So somewhat related, unrelated questions, since you work for the Red Tab Foundation, which is part of Levi's and Levi's is known for jeans. Are you interested in making jeans at all? Have you tried it? And does being kind of in that part, a specific part of the fashion and textile industry make you more interested in jeans as a garment? Um, I haven't tried making jeans. I feel like that's where I draw the line of like, where they might get (laughs) mad at me. (laughs) I'm going to leave that to the pros. It's, there's this funny thing too. Like if you ever, you know, hear people who work at a clothing company, but you're kind of expected to wear that clothing when you show up to work. And so I'm going to show up in my me mates because that's that. But if I showed up in like my own jeans, I don't know if they'd get mad, but I'm probably going to just keep buying. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but I do hope I get some denim scraps and I have had some fun like upcycling some denim that I already had into different projects like I turned a pair of Jason's jeans into like this cool tote bag um, that we then gave to his sister as a gift um, and some fun projects like that so I have I'll probably do more more upcycling with denim because you know we make like it's really sturdy jeans and that's one of the benefits to denim is that it can be used like and upcycled so many times because it's like a forever material in a way one of the last times I spoke to my mother-in-law who is um, she lives in England and she's been sewing all her life she said that she has a pile of denim just like that she had sourced from people who were giving him away or, or sending him to the charity shop and you know some are super old some are kind of tatty but like she's uh she's gonna make stuff with it because of the uh what would I like the integrity of the material like you just you know you can turn it yeah. into something else and reuse it so she's she's pumped am I turning into your mother-in-law I totally have a pile of those too I yeah you're basically <laughs> right. the same yeah basically. right you know me and an old English lady <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I not kidding have like four or five pairs down here because Vincent is a, a, a crotch seam buster as am I, but um, he did not enjoy the patches that I put in the first few times. He was like, it's fine. Like, you can just have these <laughs> you can make something with them. So I've been sitting on those. I was thinking of making slippers because they are so thick and you can kind of, if my machine can tolerate it, I wanted to make like the base and kind of like an espadrille style-esque thing because I think really it would be cool. really cool, right? Yeah. I've it might require more someone... hand work. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I also heard of someone recently who said denim was the ultimate um, hat fabric because it's so stiff. So like a th- thick denim interface was like if you sew your own hats, they won't like flop like a lot of fabric hats did. So I haven't tried that, but I saw I saw someone shared that. Like denim as the, the outer fabric? I guess like it's like kind of like the, the inner, you know, 
Yeah, yeah like like almost yeah. like a like batting or something like the I in could between. See that. Mm-hmm. The only hat I've made is waxed canvas, and it itself is like pretty stable. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyways, um, so you mentioned at the beginning of the episode that you are getting married in May, so we all can't wait to see updates on your wedding dress. And I know you mentioned the rehearsal dinner dress, but you're also making. Is that the only dress you're making? Or are you making multiple outfits? And kind of what does that whole project look like for you? So we're doing a small destination wedding, which means I have like a four day event and I'm like, well, I have nothing better to do. Maybe I'll make <laughs> four days of outfits. I don't know. Right mm-hmm. now I've just got that rehearsal dinner dress because I wanted to, I tried on poofy dresses and I was like, I never thought I would like a poofy dress, but I'm going to make that one as like a backup. And then I am also making the wedding dress. It's been such a fun project. Um, you know, I have this like this, this experience that I don't think a lot of people have where I'm like, is just another dress, <laughs> you know, like, I think there's this like American, maybe capitalism driven thing where like people epitomize their wedding dress for their whole lives. And you have to be the most beautiful you've ever looked. And like, I'm just making another cool dress. But this time I get to justify using really expensive materials for like the first time ever. <laughs> um, so I'm having a lot of fun with that. I tried on dresses in the shops to get a sense of like what kind of style I liked um, and what best suited, you know, my body. And I learned a couple like, you know, couture placement techniques, like where you should place the straps to frame your collarbone and stuff like that from trying on dresses. And then um I was going to um, self-draft a pattern, but like the style I'm going for, I realized, I don't know if I really need to. Right now I'm thinking about like a sweetheart cut up top, um, maybe strapless, and then kind of fitted through the hips and then like a trumpet skirt um, kind of flowing out at the bottom. So fitted um, through the bodice and the hips and then open at the bottom. And I've procured some like gorgeous white silk and I have my eye on some specific like gorgeous, gorgeous beaded fabric. So the rehearsal dinner dress is also like practicing using the fabric <laughs> mm-hmm. before I cut into like the really good fabric. It's a rehearsal. It is a yeah. rehearsal. It's more than one way. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's a good point. Um, and so, yeah, I should probably start. Uh, well, no, I've got like seven months. I've got enough time to still like I'll make a couple muslins and then I'll just whip up the dress and it's good it's been so much fun it's like i've i've looked at every youtuber who's made her own wedding dress like there's such fun stories and you're so proud of it you know and it's gonna take forever like the beating like i might have to do a lot of hand stitching i don't know but it's like this is my hobby you know like i don't mind if it takes forever it's like the way some people build miniature houses i'll just like you know hand stitch my dress <laughs> I love it. I'm in the same boat, but my wedding hopefully is not until next August and I only have to make a tank top, mm-hmm. which, you know, like maybe it'll spiral. We have a year to get there. <laughs> you got time. You should get on the train, make your dress. It sounds fun. Well, we're also, we're also doing destination again, mm-hmm. I hope because this venue is like questionable, but yeah, like you said, it's three or four days. You have multiple outfit changes. I think If you're into garment sewing, you're obviously into clothing. And so for me, it was like, I've got the dress and then I've got like some other outfits planned. But you're right. There's there's more that could be done and there's plenty of time. Right. No panic sewing here. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Honestly, like I don't even I don't even care so much about wearing the dress so much as I care about the process of making it. It's just like another challenge, you know, like I yeah. love a good yeah. challenge and I don't have any occasions to wear nice things. Like when am I ever going to make a nice dress? <laughs> I don't go anywhere where I would wear things. <laughs> things. So it's my like one chance to use the nice fabric and to, like have people that want to see a cool dress I made. And like, yeah, it's less about wearing it and it's more about the fun that comes with like a good challenge. Love it. Oh, that sounds really special. I got married a while ago, so and way before I learned how to sew, but I had thought about like I would love to have done something like that. I still have my wedding dress and I feel I felt a little bit like you, Ella, where I was like, it's just another dress. So I was just like, I found one, it was reasonably priced, I look great in it. I'm like, great. Um, but and I don't have regrets. The only would be that like if I could somehow have learned to sew before is that I would have done it myself. Like, because I think I would really, like, really enjoy that. So maybe for like 
an anniversary or something, I'll take apart my wedding dress and like use the material and remake it. But um, that's very exciting Ooh. for you. I can't wait to see how it all turns out. And um, yeah, you've, you've got time. And so we look forward to, to following along with your journey there as well. So I'm going to close this out by asking you a very important question. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your dog whose name is Kitten? <laughs> yes, Kitten the dog is my quarantine puppy and my most important sewing advocate. <laughs> he is a mini golden doodle. We got him right when the pandemic started. He shows up on my on my Insta a lot. He's just like whenever I'm up until 1 a.m. sewing, like he's there by my side, keeping me company. Like he's on the ground with me when I am cutting fabric on the floor. And he has this amazing attribute where he sees the, you know, the fabric and the paper and he'll never step on it. Like he just naturally oh. knows not to walk into the sewing zone. Oh, it's magic. Yeah. I didn't teach him that. So it's great. And with all my scraps, sometimes I'll make like a matching bandana for Kit. <laughs> I'm like totally that cringy person who like yeah. I love no. I love using those scraps and Kit and I have like six or seven matching outfits. It's cool. <laughs> oh, Ada and I. So first of all, that is a magic skill because Zizu, my dog, is always like in my business whenever I'm anywhere near the yeah, ground. Yeah, like he loves oh, Mochi yeah. loves fabric. He just likes to sit. Oh on yeah. It. <laughs> Yeah. And I think maybe he likes the set. My, my dog likes the sound of like his paws on paper. I'm, I'm like, oh, get off. That took me forever to tape. Um, but so, so there's that fantastic kit. Well done. And then um, Ada and I were talking about like making matching outfits with our dogs as like a season, season two project. Yes. Um, because, <laughs> yeah. I am totally that type of dog parent. Like I've had my dog, he just turned 13 and I've had him since he was 10 weeks old. So we're like this. I, I always, I, people on the podcast may have heard me say this already, but I've had him longer than I've known my husband. So we know where the hierarchy is <laughs> number in, one. In, in our family. Yeah. yeah. You're number but, one oh, advocate. That's a wonderful. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just can't believe the kitten came that way. Like can can Ken teach Mochi not to sit on fabric? I don't, I don't know. He's just, he's, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful skill. But also, <laughs> we also, we named him Kitten. It's like funny. Like, I just think it's like hysterical to name a dog after their opposite. Like, that's just my sense of humor. <laughs> I think that's so funny, but it's good. It's funny to see like how people react to, to a dog named Kitten. You know, it's either they like laugh and like, oh, you're my person. Or they're like, what? Like so confused. <laughs> Which is also funny. <laughs> I love it. Anyways, thank you. Uh, I'm going to start that outro again. Sorry. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ella. We so enjoyed getting to know you and Kitten better. Before we sign off, can you remind our listeners where they can find you and keep up with your work? Yeah, so I'm mainly just on Instagram, at Handmade Millennial. I'll, I'll just one word. And we will have a link to Ella's profile in the show notes and on our Instagram as well. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Asian Soloist Collective podcast. Next week, we will be digging into the topic of mindful fabric choices and how it coincides with our identities and so much more. If you like our show, please consider supporting us on Coffee. Your financial support helps us with overhead expenses and will allow us to give a little back to our currently all-volunteer team who work so hard to provide you with new content each week, and our guests who also provide their time as volunteers. The link to our coffee page can be found in the show notes, our website, and on our Instagram account. It's ko-fi.com slash Asian Sewist Collective. Check us out on Instagram at Asian Sewist Collective. That's one word, Asian Sewist Collective. And you can help us by spreading the word and telling your friends. We would appreciate it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All of the links and resources mentioned in today's episode will be in the show notes on our website. That's AsianSewistCollective.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your questions, comments, or even voice messages if you'd like to be featured on a future episode at AsianSewistCollective at gmail.com. This episode was brought to you by your co-hosts, Ada Chen and Nicole Angeline. This episode was researched by Arthi Rubby, produced by Ada Chen and me, and edited by Henry Wong. Video editing was also provided by me, Nicole Angeline. 
Thank you so much to the other members of our collective who made this week's episode a reality. This is the Asian Sos Collective Podcast, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>